Welcome to the Food for Your Soul podcast, where we apply the Word of God to the hearts of men and women to stoke the fires of your delight in Christ. All right, Mark chapter 12, starting in verse 12. This passage preaches two sermons, one by Jesus and one by Mark. Jesus is going to teach us about Caesar and the government, and Mark is going to teach us about Jesus. So, passage preaches two sermons, so I'm going to preach two sermons. So, we'll break this up into two. I'll start with Mark's sermon about Jesus. So, this is just that first part, and then in a separate recording, we'll do the other sermon. I believe one of Mark's purposes in this passage here is to showcase some facets of Christ's glory. And their facets that shine against the backdrop, uh, the pitch black backdrop of the character of the religious leaders in Israel that Jesus is interacting with in the temple. In order to really see the brilliance and the glory and majesty and beauty of Jesus' character, we can best appreciate it in the stark relief against the, the chief priests and the Pharisees and the teachers of law and the elders of Israel and their character. They were men with plenty of character flaws, for sure, but there's one that Mark that just stands out. Mark has really gone out of his way to show us this one, this character flaw, namely fear of man. Mark shows us the ugliness of that sin, and then he turns our attention over to Jesus and his character to show us the opposite of that sin. So let's first look at the sin, and then we'll turn our attention to Christ. Fear of man. Now, fear of man is when you desire man's approval or fear man's disapproval more than God's. It's when you fear, which when you desire man's approval or fear the disapproval more than you desire God's approval or fear his disapproval. If you're more afraid of what man might do to you than you are of the consequences of crossing God, or if you crave human approval, approval of certain people in your life, or maybe just the approval of everyone. Everyone, you just want everyone to like you, whichever it is. That's fear of man. And the spiritual leaders of Israel at the time of Jesus were the poster children for this sin, fear of man. Mark really wants us to see that in this section. Look at verse 18 of chapter 11. If you go back to chapter 11, verse 18, the chief priests and the teachers of the law began looking for a way to kill Jesus, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. They were so driven by their desire for popularity and the respect of the people that they became murderous when they saw Jesus taking the the crowd's uh, attention away from them onto him. They were the opposite of John the Baptist who said, he should become greater, I should become less. They were the exact opposite of that. Now skip down to verse 30 of chapter 11, and Jesus asked them where John's authority came from. And it says, verse 31, they discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say from men, they feared the people, for everyone held that John really was a prophet. And so they answered Jesus, we don't know. So when, when someone is infected with this disease of fearing man. That governs how he answers questions, how he responds to things. The truth is irrelevant. When it comes to answering a question, the truth doesn't even enter into it. Even, that's not even part of the discussion. Just answering truthfully doesn't even enter, enter the consideration because it's all about what answer will win me the most respect from the most people or the people that I want respect from. And that's the only consideration. If these men were believed that the, 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 the people under their care were being duped by a false prophet and led astray away from God, but speaking up would cost them popularity, they'd just keep their mouths shut. They didn't care. It's like if, you, if all these people are going to end up in hell, so what? I, I'm not going to say anything because I'm afraid of the crowds. That's the way they are. They're like modern pastors who will allow people in their own flock to be deceived rather than risk criticism for calling out a false teacher. They care more about avoiding controversy than they do about people's souls. That's the way these men were. And and now Mark 
He's brought, he's brought it up twice now, and now a third time in today's passage. Jesus spoke this parable about how uh, God is like a landowner who is on his way to kill you guys. Uh, you're in trouble. You have uh, really angered him, and he's on his way to kill you. And instead of fearing God and dropping to their knees in repentance and begging for mercy, look how they respond in verse 12, Mark 12, 12. Then they looked for a way to arrest Jesus because they knew he had spoken the parable against them, but they were afraid of the crowd, and so they left him and went away. So once again, they're afraid. They're not one bit afraid of God, but they're scared to death of this crowd. And so three times in the last several paragraphs, Mark has made a point of how these men are just absolutely driven by fear of man. And whenever Mark does this, whenever he turns the spotlight on someone in his gospel, the, the implication is for the reader to ask, is that me? Right? Because remember, Scripture is a mirror. It shows us our own hearts. It shows us what's, by showing us what's going on inside the hearts of men. You normally can't do this, but the Bible writers will do that. They'll show you what's going on inside the affections of men, inside their thoughts and their hearts. Whenever it does that, the goal is for us to peer into our own hearts and see if there's any of that same sin driving us. None of us knows exactly how we would have responded in that exact situation if we'd have been in their shoes and we were those chief priests and we, you know, we don't know how we, but what we can do is look at our lives right now and ask these questions. Am I an approval junkie, right? Do, do you judge your life based on the praise or lack of praise of others? Is that how you assess how well you're doing? What effect does it have on you if 10 people criticize you or if 10 people praise you? How does that compare with the effect on your emotions when you read in the Bible that God is pleased with you or displeased? Do you ever daydream about people being impressed with you? When you pray in church or don't pray in church, are you motivated by what people are going to think about how good this prayer is? Do you work harder when your boss is watching? Are you te tempted to uh, affirm gossip just because you, you don't want any, any tension or discomfort with the person gossiping and so you just kind of go along? Do you worry and fret about what people think of you? Do you show favoritism toward people whose respect you really desire? Do you treat them better? Do you think of rejection as one of the worst things a person could experience? Do you avoid conflicts rather than solving them? Do you hate being rebuked or corrected? That's a big one. Proverbs says you hate correction, you're going to die. When you meet new people, do you spend more time thinking about how to impress them or how to minister to them? Have you ever avoided closeness in a relationship for fear of getting hurt? Do you see people as priests with the power to make you feel clean or dirty? So if they approve of you, you're okay. If they don't, you're not. Or do you see people as uh, dangerous, unpredictable terrorists? So you have to keep your guard up all the time to keep from getting hurt. Or do you see people as dictators whose word and opinion is law for you? Have you ever kept your mouth shut about the gospel or about Christ because you were afraid of what people might think or how they might respond? This is an issue for cowards who are afraid of getting hurt or being criticized. This is an issue for egomaniacs. Fear of man is an issue for egomaniacs who have to have popular applause. Fear of man is an issue for approval junkies who have to have the affirmation of certain people. And fear of man is an issue for everyone whose life is driven by what people think, popular opinion. It's a big problem, fear of man. If it's not the number one cause of unfaithfulness to God, it's gotta be up in the top two or three, I would think. If you question how serious this issue is, just consider Galatians 1.10. It's a frightening verse. It says, if, if I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. 
If I were, if I were trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. That's, that's as serious as it gets, right? And for that reason, fear of man is strictly forbidden in Scripture. God says, you can't do this. Isaiah 51, 7, Do not fear the repro reproach of men or be terrified by their insults. Don't do it. We're not permitted to murder. We're not permitted to commit adultery. We're not permitted to steal. And we're not permitted to fear men. It's forbidden. It's a sin. It's evil. It's wrong. It's disobedience. And it destroys your life. It really does ruin your life. Mark is showing us in this passage how devastating fear of man, the effect of fear of man has on the person doing the fearing. For one thing, it leads you into hypocrisy. Look at verse 15, Mark 12, 15. Jesus knew their hypocrisy. That's the Greek word for an actor, somebody who puts on a mask and pretends to be someone he isn't. Uh, you, you sample that person on the outside, and you get one thing, and you look inside, and you get something very different. That's a hypocrite. It's the opposite of integrity, which we'll talk about in a minute. Integrity is when you're the same all the time, when you're alone, in front of a crowd, at home, at work, at church, uh, tired, well-rested, in a crisis, on vacation, wherever you are, your character is always the same. That's integrity. Hypocrisy is the opposite of that. You're one thing here, and you're another thing there. You're one thing on the outside, different thing on the inside. And integrity is a rare virtue. It's a rare virtue. Why is that? Why, have you ever thought about it? Why is integrity so hard? I mean, if I am whatever I am, why is it hard for me to just be that all the time? Right? Just be the same all the time. Why is that hard? Well, fear of man. That's what makes me want to pretend. Fear of man. I adjust what I am in order to win the approval of whoever's around or to avoid the disapproval of rejection. Uh, when I'm at church, um, I want the people there to respect me, to look up to me, so I act like the type of person that I think they'll respect. When I'm around enemies, I don't want them to hurt me, and so I hide the parts of me that will uh, set them off and cause them to get mad. When I'm at work, I'm tempted to morph into whatever version of me I think will win those people's respect. It, we be, become chameleons, we become hypocrites because of fear of man. It, it, it destroys integrity. We value people's opinions of us so highly that we become chameleons. And we have to, we, we have, to have the, that, that approval that we so desperately crave. And, and so you know, all it takes is a little deception. Like I can have this approval, all I do is just be a little bit deceptive. I just pretend I have strengths I don't have, and I cover up the flaws I do have, and voila, I'm amazing, right? And everybody will like me, and nobody will hurt me. So fear of man will do that. It'll make you a fundamentally dishonest person in the way that you present yourself, and a hopelessly inconsistent person to the point where you'll get to where you don't even know who you are or what you are. You're like an actor who's only in the movies and never in real life, right? And you, there is no real you. So your whole life becomes one big lie. Fear of man makes you dishonest. Look at what, look, look at what liars these guys are. Verse 14, teacher, we know that you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. They're just piling it on. Oh, Jesus, you're so amazing. And you, at this point, you want to say, to, you want Jesus to stop and say, oh, gee, thanks. Uh, well, does that mean you're going to follow me now? Right? I mean, you, you're signing up to be one of my followers? One of my just Because you're saying, I'm teaching the way of God in accordance with the truth. You're all for following the way of God, right? So does this, this mean you're going to follow me? No, Jesus doesn't even bother asking that because look at verse 15. Jesus knew their hypocrisy. He knew they weren't the same on the inside as they were pretending to be on the outside. It was obvious because if they had meant any of that, they would have been his followers. Jesus knew exactly what was going on here. It was the same thing that had been going along all through the book. When he says, why are you trying to trap me in verse 15? Your Bible might say, why are you testing me? You're putting me to the test. That's the third time in this book that Mark has used that word to describe the way these leaders were approaching Jesus. Uh, first one was back in chapter 8, verse 11. It says, The Pharisees came to Jesus and began to question Him to test Him. There's our word. To test Him, they asked Him for a sign from heaven. 
And then in Mark 10, 2, some Pharisees came and tested him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? So that word to test in this context, the same word used in the Old Testament when it talks about don't put God to the test. And in that context, it means don't challenge God to, you know, don't provoke him to discipline you. Uh, in this context, w w we used to, about Jesus, it means a similar thing. It means it's a public challenge of Jesus for the purpose of exposing something that they could use to discredit him. It's like, why are you doing that? Why are you trying to publicly challenge me to find a way to discredit me? Why are you doing He knows. He knows exactly what they're doing. And they're, they're doing it by using flattery. Now, flattery is when you, use, when you say something complimentary to someone that you don't really mean because you have some ulterior motive. That's flattery. You're trying to manipulate the person to like you or to treat you well or to be in a good mood or whatever. You just by the way that you act, but you don't really mean it. Flattery is evil because it is dishonesty. It's lying. Psalm 78, 36, they would flatter him with their mouths, lying to him with their tongues. Flattery, lying, same thing. Proverbs 26, 28, a lying tongue hates those it hurts, and a flattering mouth works ruin. Again, lying and flattering parallel. Psalm 12, 2, everyone lies to his neighbor, their flattering lips speak with deception. So, these men were lying to Jesus. It was easy to see that they were lying because they weren't following Christ. And they didn't mean any of this praise. They're just giving lip service to, oh, you teach the way of God. And he did teach the way of God. You know, it's, it's easy to give lip service to the way of God, right? We're all for the way of God. Yeah, I want to follow God. I'm committed to God's will. But then when someone shows you some specific thing that is in God's will, that the Bible says is God's will, then you're like, uh, well, okay, but not that one, <laughs> right? How often does that happen? No, I'm not going to reconcile with my spouse. Not that one. I'm not going to give that money back. I'm not going to patch that relationship up. I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to humble myself. I'm not going to, uh, it's like the old prayer. God, make me pure, but, but not tonight. I don't really mean it. 1 John 1, 6, if we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie. We lie. 1 John 2, 4, the man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar. Jesus sees through our hypocrisy. When it says he knew their hypocrisy, he, he knows our hypocrisy too. He can see it. He sees right through it. We go to church and try to pretend to be something we're not. We got to put in this big act. At church, and it's like it's like hiding underneath a clear plastic sheet. And God says, "Like uh, you know, I can see through that, right? <laughs> you can't pull anything over on Christ." So that's what these guys are trying to do. They they think they can pull something over on him, and he just sees right through it and sees that they are hypocrites. Fear of man will make you a hypocrite. Fear of man will make you a liar. Thirdly, it will make you a coward. Fear of man will make you a coward. Just like the chief priests and the Pharisees who are constantly afraid of the crowd, it'll make you like them. And this is, again, this is a deadly evil. Cowardice is a horrible sin. Revelation 21.8, the cowardly, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. That's, that's pretty bad, right? That's a bad sin. Why? Why is it such a big deal? Because fear of rejection will drive you in whatever direction the world's pressure wants you to go. And that's not a good direction. Guess what direction the world wants you to go? Down God's path? No. Opposite way. God points towards righteousness. The world likes to go this way. And if you're afraid of them, guess which way you're going to go? They're going to pressure you to go their way. That's why Scripture puts fear of man in the same category as unfaithfulness to God. It's unfaithfulness because it makes you forget God. Fear of man makes you forget God. Isaiah 51, 12. Who are you that you fear mortal men that you forget the Lord your maker? We, we have no right to fear men because just as our love, for, uh, our love and our worship and allegiance belong to God alone, so does our fear belong to God alone.
We have, we have no right to give it to another. Just as you can't serve two masters, neither can you fear two masters, because you'll ultimately serve whomever you fear the most. Fear of man takes control of your life, takes, it takes control away from God, and puts it into the hands of men. So fearing men is a failure to fear God. It's a failure to remember God. It's a f failure to serve God. It results in disobedience because it drives you in the direction of earthly pleasure, uh, worldly pleasure, and ultimately it's a failure to love God. Fear of man is a failure to love God. It's a failure to love God because part of loving someone is caring about what they think, right? So if I care more about what people think than what God thinks, I don't love God. If you love someone, you're going to care about what they think. And one more effect this will have, fear of man will have on you. It leads to favoritism. It's another sin that's forbidden in Scripture. We treat the people whose favor we covet better than we treat other people uh, whose opinion we don't care about. And so not only do we violate the first commandment and fail to love God, but we violate the second commandment as well. We don't love people. The people whose opinion doesn't matter to us, we don't care what they think, we're just not going to treat them as well because our focus is on pleasing the people whose opinion does matter. So we'll mistreat the people we don't care about. And the people whose opinion we do care about, we fail to love them too because uh, what we're doing is manipulation. So if I care about this guy's opinion and I don't care about her opinion and I'm going to treat her poorly, I'm going to treat him well, but that's still not loving because I'm treating him well for selfish motives. That's not love. That's the opposite of love. It's selfishness. It's just manipulation. We show kindness and respect and whatever else, not for their good, but for my good. And then, uh, that's the opposite of love. It's selfishness. Okay, so that's fear of man. Okay, got it? That's the ugliness of the sin. That's... Enough about that, right? Okay, enough about ugliness of sin. Let's turn our attention now to the beauty of Christ and his example in this area. What does it look like when a man perfectly fears God instead of fearing men? What does that look like? Mark has already painted the portrait of Jesus' courage and integrity and total faithfulness to God in Jesus' actions. We've seen that throughout the book, right? Especially lately in the book. Uh, in his approach to Jerusalem, even though Jesus knew Jerusalem was the hotbed, the center, the core, the headquarters for his opposition against him, he knew that's where he would get into trouble. And when he arrived there, that they would torture him and kill him. He announced that several times. He told his disciples, that's what's going to happen as soon as we get to Jerusalem. Still, we've watched his unflinching uh, confidence and courage as he marched straight into the lion's den going to Jerusalem right into Jerusalem, right out in front, leading the way. Remember that passage when, it, when he was approaching Jerusalem? It says he was leading the way, and his disciples and the crowd, they were stumbling back. They were dragging their heels, dragging their feet in fear, and he was just on a mission, not one bit scared. We saw him go directly into the temple and not only enter the lion's den, but poke the lion in the eye <laughs> by, by ransacking the temple. He publicly humiliated the most powerful men in the country right there in the temple in front of everybody. He faced them down. He, was, he, he told a parable condemning them as, as prophet killers. And he says, God is going to kill you. Fearless. Fearless. So we've seen all that. We've watched all that play out. We've seen his, his courage and his integrity throughout the book. Now that we've seen it, Mark wants us to hear it, and he's just going to state it explicitly. So we're going to hear it, and in Mark's wonderful irony, we're going to hear it from the mouths of Jesus' man-fearing enemies. They're the ones that are actually going to say the words. So after Jesus gives the parable, they respond once again with their fear of man, verse 12, and they looked for a way to arrest him because they knew he had spoken the parable against them, but they were afraid of the crowd, so they left him and went away. They went away, but they're not giving up. Verse 13, later they sent one of the Pharisees, uh, some of the Pharisees and the Herodians to Jesus to catch him in his words. So they send the Pharisees and the Herodians. 
they, they, they can't do this themselves. They have to send some other people. They, obviously, they can't do this themselves because their whole tactic here is they're going to use flattery and try and trick Jesus into thinking, oh, we're on your side and we're, we, we're all for you. And, and he's not going to fall for that if it's these guys because they, they already had a conflict with he already had a conflict with them. So they send a fresh, some fresh faces, some new Pharisees, and then also some Herodians. And uh, normally, Pharisees and Herodians would be enemies. Right? They're, they're, would, they're definitely on opposite ends of the spectrum. So you have these powerful people who would normally be enemies joining together against Jesus. Powerful forces coalescing to oppose Christ. That is a fulfillment of Psalm 2. Psalm 2, 2. The rulers gather together against the Lord and against His anointed one. So Psalm 2 is happening. It's happening. It's being fulfilled. The powers of the world are joining forces against the Lord's anointed. We're seeing it unfold right there in the temple. And they're doing it in a very strategic way. There's a reason why they include both Pharisees and Herodians. Very strategic. They want Jesus to feel pressure from both sides of this question that they're going to try to trick him with. In verse 14. Verse 14, here's the question. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? That's the question they, they drop on him. Now that question is a very, very big issue in Jesus' time. Rome was a pagan invading army that had declared martial law in Israel. They had occupied Israel, martial law, and guess how they raised the money needed to pay the soldiers for the occupation? They taxed the Jews with a head tax, a one denarius head tax. Now, a one denarius, that's a denarius is about what you would get paid for a day's, a, a, a day laborer would get paid for one day's work. So I don't know, think about it like a hundred dollar bill. Um, each male Jew had to pay that. Now you can imagine how that went over. You had, every Jewish man, rich or poor, had to pay the bill for his enemies to oppress him. Right? These soldiers that are oppressing him, I have to pay their salary. And that's, I mean, that's bad enough. That's not even the half of it. The denarius was a coin minted for the purpose of this very tax. And, and it had a portrait of Caesar with an inscription on there that was, that was him as the son of God. So it was basically a little idol. It was a graven image. And so there were people in Israel who believed it was a violation of the law of God. It was a violation of the Old Testament to pay this tax. You're giving money to pagans to oppress the people of God using an idolatrous coin. The zealots they wouldn't even pay this. In fact, not only would they not pay the tax, they wouldn't even touch a denarius because they said that is a filthy pagan idol. They're not going to touch it. Now, not long before this, when if you want to know how big a deal this tax was, not, not long before this time, this is when, in, during Jesus' life, when he was about 10 or 12 years old, a man named Judas of Galilee read a, led a revolt against Rome over this tax. He's like insurrection. He said, if you pay that tax, you're a coward and you're unfaithful to God because you're giving tribute to the Romans and you're putting pagan masters in place of God as rulers over God's people. That's wrong. It's sin. And so this guy, Judas of Galilee, led a revolt against Rome over this tax, an armed conflict with Rome. If you want to know how that worked out for him, you can read about it in Acts 5. Verse 37, it says, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led, uh, uh, the census is when they instituted this tax, and led a band of people in revolt. He too was killed and all his followers were scattered. Rome, Rome just came and crushed him. They just crushed him. But that didn't put an end to the movement. It kept going. Just six years after this conversation in Mark 12, when Jesus is having this conversation, just six years later, um, they tried it again. And again, on a bigger scale, 30 years later, which resulted in the annihilation of Jerusalem in, uh, by Rome in 70 AD. You, you know about 70 AD, right? Rome wiped out it, it, Jerusalem, just annihilated Jerusalem. That happened because they were rebelling over taxes. It was a revolt against Rome over taxes. And the first thing they did in that insurrection was the Jews minted their own coins. 
So this is a very, very big deal. It's a hot, hot issue among the people of Israel at Jesus' time. They do not like this tax. And since the Messiah's whole job is to come and be a deliverer, right? That's what the Messiah was. He was a deliverer. He's going to deliver them from the, their oppressors. Then if, he, if, if Jesus answers this question and says, Ah, oh, yeah, just pay the tax. Well, that's going to totally disqualify him as being any kind of a Messiah or deliverer at all in the eyes of the people. What good is a deliverer who just says, oh, yeah, just keep going as you are now? You know, what do we need a Messiah for that for? I mean, we can just we could do that on our own. Just remain subservient to your enemies. That's the Messiah's message. No, Jesus says that and he's done in their eyes as a potential Messiah. But. On the other hand, if Jesus answers the other way, and here's where the Herodians come in. If Jesus speaks out against the tax, he says, yeah, don't pay the tax, revolt. Um, then the Herodians, who are tied in with the Roman government, they go straight to their government, the contacts in the, in the government, and report Jesus. They say, we've got another Judas of Galilee on our hands, and uh, except this time it's a Jesus of Galilee, and the, the Romans would come and they would crush him just like they crushed Judas of Galilee. And we know from Luke's account that this is the answer that they were rooting for, right? They've got him, they're trying to set up, put him on the horns of a dilemma, but they really hope that, I mean, either way, they, fi they figure they've got him and he's finished, but they really hope, if they get their preference, they really hope he speaks against the tax because then Rome will just come and kill him and then the, the problem solved. That's what they want. That's what they want. They want Jesus... Now get this, they want Jesus to feel the pressure from the crowds, uh, and just like they do. They want Jesus to, be, to feel the same thing they feel when they're afraid of the crowds. They want him to feel that pressure, and for that pressure to dictate how he responds and how he answers. That's what they want. Uh, this is what's known in politics today as a gotcha question, right? We see that. We just had a whole season of that. And the modern politicians have made an art form out of bypassing gotcha questions and refusing to answer them and uh, changing the subject. So they, uh, they, you ask them a gotcha question, and something that might make them look bad if they answer it. And they, uh, you can always tell when they're going to do this because they'll always start out by saying, look. And then they, and then they start talking about something else. And, they, and they, there's, so many, there's so much of a preamble and all this other stuff. By the time they're done... You don't even remember the question you asked him anyway. That's the whole, that's how, that's how they do it. So that's what, but they don't want Jesus to do that. They want Jesus to give a straight answer because they, they want him to get into trouble. And so they ask him twice for a straight up, up or down, yes or no answer. Verse 14, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay or shouldn't we? Yes or no? Which is it, Jesus? And just to make sure he doesn't try to give a politician answer, they try to box him in with some flattery about how honest and courageous he is. That's where this flattery comes in. So they say, verse 14, they came to him and said, Teacher, we know you're a man of integrity. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So Jesus can't give a weaselly answer now because they just praised him for not ever giving weaselly answers. See, that's what they're doing. After being publicly praised by such prestigious men for having courage and not being afraid of anyone, Jesus can't back away from the question and be afraid uh, to stand up against Rome. Right? He can't act like he's afraid of Rome after they just said, oh, you're not afraid of anyone. So they're trying to use this flattery to get Jesus to feel pressure and cave into it. They praise Jesus for not caring about people's opinion in order to get him to care about people's opinions. That's, that's what they're trying to do. That, that, that's the whole point of flattery, right? Flattery doesn't work if the person doesn't care about your opinion. If I try to flatter you, you don't care what I think, then the flattery is not going to have any effect. If I lavish praise... So it, it, they're, they're trying to get Jesus to violate the very virtue that they're praising him for. Their goal in flattering Jesus is to make the flattery untrue, to, to praise him for having integrity in order to get him to not have 
integrity. They praise him for not being afraid of anyone in order to make them make him fear man. And they're trying to make all their flattery prove false. And they think it'll work. They're pretty sure this will work. They've seen Jesus' courage, right? They know that. No doubt they're envious of it. You know they hated it because it condemned them. You know it was with anger, probably, that they said these words. You don't care. You're not swayed by men because you don't care who they are. You know, <laughs> like you don't care who we are. And we, you, know, you should be afraid of us. So they've seen this. They've seen this in Jesus. And yet still, they think this will work because they just can't imagine Jesus not really deep down being just like them. They think, they, they believe Jesus, if they believed Jesus really was a man of integrity, and that he wasn't, didn't care what people thought, why use flattery? There'd be no point in it, right? If, if Jesus always gives honest answers, then what good would it do to pressure him into giving a dishonest answer? Or why would they need to feel like that to pressure him to give an honest answer if he always gives honest answers? Well, I think it's because they, they can't imagine themselves giving an honest answer if they were in his shoes in this context. You know, people are like that. People, people were enslaved to a particular sin very often um, think that everyone else is more or less like them. We project our sins. So liars don't trust you because they think you're just as dishonest as they are. And uh, angry people assume you're mad at them. And uh, impatient people think you're sick and tired of them. We just do that. We, we project our sins and weaknesses onto other people. And so that's what they do to Jesus. And uh, they give this flattery. Well, they're about to find out just how true their flattering words really were. Jesus didn't care about human opinion, especially theirs. He really didn't care. Uh, so you can see that in his response. Now, try to imagine yourself in this situation. What would you, how would you, I mean, suppose uh, you're in front of a whole big crowd. You got some big shot. Maybe you're being introduced in a church. Some famous pastor or the governor or somebody is introducing you. And they lavish all this praise on you. And they say, man, this guy, this, you, this person is impeccable to integrity. And man, they just teach the truth and they're not afraid of anything. And, and that's how they introduce you. And then, you, then they hand you the mic. How would you respond? What would you say? Well, look how Jesus responded. Verse 15. Why are you trying to trap me? And in fact, Matthew tells us, first he called them hypocrites. <laughs> it's like, you hypocrite. Can you imagine this? I mean, just picture the scene. These guys are the most respected, important people. And if you were in that situation and you get this flowery introduction and then you get the mic and you turn, and you say, yeah, you big hypocrite. Can you imagine Jesus was the opposite of a hypocrite because he's just not, he's not one bit afraid of these men or anyone else. And you can almost see Mark winking at us as he writes this because the way he's constructed his gospel, everything Mark has been showing us about Jesus is perfectly encapsulated in this flattery, which turns out to be 100% true. We know you're a man of integrity, you're not swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. They say you're a man of integrity. Literally, you're true. That's the Greek. It just says you're true in the sense of you're, you're consistent. You're always the same. And so I think integrity is a good translation because that's what integrity means. I once asked my Hebrew professor, uh, Robert Alden, how to define the word integrity. And he had an interesting answer. He said, integrity, uh, he sat down at his desk, he says, integrity is like homogenized milk. <laughs> and he said, you take milk, before it's homogenized, uh, then it separates, the fat separates from the milk. We used to get milk from a dairy and it would do this. We'd, it would put in the refrigerator and then you get, and you have all the fat sitting on top. But when you homogenize it, mix it all in, then it's all, all the same. So you, either you take some milk from the top or the middle or the bottom, wherever you sample it, you get the same thing, homogenized, consistent, integrity. That's what the word is. A man of integrity is the same wherever you sample him, whether you catch him at church or at home or at work or in public or in a crowd or among conservatives or among liberals or wherever you, wherever you find him, he's the same. And that's Jesus. That's Jesus. He's always the same. 
in public and private, when he's tired, when he's rested, in front of a hostile enemies, at home with friends, around the big shots, talking to children, always the same. Same Jesus. That's integrity. And it's the opposite of being a hypocrite, which is what these men were. They were one thing on the outside. You sample them on the outside, you get one thing. You sample them on the inside, you get something totally different. Um, when they called Jesus a man of integrity, what they were doing in that moment was the opposite of integrity. Right? So they say, you're a man of integrity, and then they say this, verse 14, you aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. You're just not afraid of powerful people. You don't care how much power they have. Jesus did that. He, was, he, was, he, he rebuked the most powerful people in public office right, right to their face in the temple. He wasn't afraid. He single-handedly just goes in and ransacks the temple. He, he, he faces down Pilate on trial. When he's on trial for his life, he just faces down Pilate. And Pilate's astonished. And Pilate says, don't you realize? I mean, Pilate says, give me an answer. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to talk. And, and, and Pilate says, don't you realize I have your life in my hands? I can, I can snap my fingers and, and they'll, they'll flog you. They'll beat you. They'll torture you. They'll kill you. Or I have the power to let you go. Don't you understand that? And Jesus uh, basically says, you know what? You got nothing. <laughs> You got nothing other than what God gave you. That's the only power you got. And he teaches Pilate like a superior instructing a student. He was just unflinching courage. And not only did he have integrity, and not only did he have courage, he also had impartiality. All of these are the opposite of fear of man. The literal translation of verse 14 is, You are true, and it is not a concern to you, about anyone because you do not look at the face of men. You do not look at the face of men. You're not afraid of powerful people and you're not swayed by favorable people. You don't even look at the people. I mean, you're, you're rich, poor, influential, powerful, weak, nobody's attractive, repulsive, male, female, young, old. You don't, you don't take any of that into consideration in the way that you deal with people. King Herod summoned Jesus and he just blew him off. But when a desperate, unclean woman grabbed his cloak, needing healing, man, he stopped and turned and spent a whole bunch of time with her. He blows right by Herod's palace at Jericho, but a blind beggar calls out. Jesus stops the whole procession and deals with that guy and honors him. He rebuked the elite authorities to their face. He honored little kids. He turned away rich, the rich young ruler who was very favorable to Jesus and had a lot of money and could have been a big help to the ministry and to the cause financially, turns him away, but then goes out of his way to minister to sick, impoverished invalids who had nothing to offer but germs. Treated everyone the same. So without any fear of man, Jesus was 100% free to focus completely on the way of God He's, he's, verse 14, you aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are, but you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. The Bible describes our life as walking. It's like you're, you're moving through life. It's like walking. Each, every time you make a decision, that's a step in some direction. And so we're just taking steps all day long. And there's a way of stepping that is in the light that is the way God operates, right? That, 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 that's the direction um, that we should walk. It's called the way of God, and it's the path that we're called to take. Job 23, 11, My feet have closely followed his steps. I have kept to his way without turning aside. The way of God, I've kept to it. Deuteronomy 8, 6, Observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in his ways. Deuteronomy 10, 12, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God and walk in all his ways. So to walk in the way of God, that's our duty. That's our whole duty. And, but it's not easy. It takes some instruction. We need to be taught. Psalm 27, 11, teach me your way, O Lord. Teach me. It's something we need to be taught. And the, the problem is a lot of teachers will teach us part of that way, but then there's other parts that they won't teach us because if they do, they're going to lose popularity. We're going to not like them or someone else is going to not like them. And there's parts of God's way that are unpopular. And so you don't get the whole picture, but not with Jesus. 
That's one thing that stood out to these guys. Like, you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You don't care who you're talking to, where you're talking, what's going on. You just give the whole thing right there. So this passage begins by showcasing these attributes of Christ. Integrity, courage, impartiality, godly training and teaching, commitment to the way of God alone, truth, honesty, no fear of man. That's Jesus. That's the beginning of the passage. If we skip it to the end of the pericope, at the end of the whole scene there, we see one more, and that's Christ's wisdom. That's another facet of his glory. Jesus, they ask Jesus this impossible question. He gives them an answer that absolutely blows their minds. Blows their minds. And verse 17 just says, they were amazed at him. <laughs> they don't try to argue. They don't say anything back. That's just how the passage ends. They were amazed at him. As much as they hated him, as much as they wanted him dead, still, they're just astonished at his wisdom. And these questions are going to continue, and we're going to see more of that as we go. As we go through this chapter, we're going to just see Christ's wisdom and his wisdom and his wisdom. We're going to see it again and again. It's going to be amazing. Christ went up against the wisest and most learned, trained elders, his, these experts, men that were his elders. And compared to him, they looked like imbeciles, just absolute morons compared to him. 1 Corinthians 1.20, where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? That's what Christ is doing here. There's a reason why the teachings of Jesus turned the world upside down. And for 2,000 years, they have exerted more influence on this planet than any other force, any other person in human history, any other organization, any school of thought, any philosophy. No one ever spoke like this man. His words are truth. His words are life. His words are the wisdom of the eternal God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this portrait of Christ's glory. And we just, we just have two requests. One, open our eyes to see it more, more vividly so that we love him more, worship him more and teach us to follow in his steps, to be men and women of integrity, and to fear you, not men. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for listening. We pray these principles from the Word of God are helping you find the peace of God as you draw nearer to the God of peace. Please remember to pray for this ministry, and remember that we're a crowd-funded ministry, so every gift helps. Just go to treasuringgod.com. Until next time, rejoice in the Lord always and set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God.